everybody. Welcome to the Locker Room. This is Southland's podcast for men where we redeem men's conversations, talk about the right things in the right ways, and I'm pumped for today. Let's go. All right. My name is Scott Hatfield, and I appreciate you checking out uh, this podcast. We're in a series called Two Words. We've covered a number of different things so far, and I'm super excited about tackling this one today. Uh, and I'm not doing it alone. I brought a friend with me, along with me. He's another guy that originally came from Louisville. He's been in ministry a long time, and he and his wife Linda have been uh, just a, a very kind help to so many people, including my wife and I, and to countless, countless families in our church and countless staff in our church. His name is Gary Black. How you doing, buddy? Fantastic. Good. You like that intro? I did, yeah. Fellow thank Louisville you. guy. So, yeah. yeah, man. We have a similar background, crazy families, and, and yeah. God has rescued us. But talk a little bit about yourself. Uh, you've got, you're, you're married. How long have you been married? You've got a couple kids, and you've got, you got grandbabies, right? Yeah, okay. got, got one. Okay, got uh, one, one. One grandson. My my son and daughter in law live here in Lexington yep. with my grandson. John. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they're nine tenths of a mile from our driveway. Okay, so that's a that's great, helpful. A great yeah. thing. Yeah, uh, daughter and son in law in Phoenix. Julie. Uh, Julie had her in ministry when I first came here the first time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She just turned forty. How can that be, and, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> How John, can that be? John's forty-four. Yeah. So, um, so Linda and I met in high school, and um, I guess in seventy-one, maybe seventy-two. Okay. But anyway, we got married in seventy-two in seventy-four. <laughs> been married. Got married in seventy-four. Yeah. Okay. Been married uh, thirty-nine years. Forty-nine years. Yeah. I was going to say. Yeah. Say I'm yeah. Older yeah. Than yeah. yeah. Forty-nine <laughs> years. Okay. So uh, yeah. It's been uh, been a fun ride. Gotcha. Yeah, still gotcha. is. Forty nine years. So when when's your anniversary? Uh, July. Okay. Uh, next year will be our fifty. Next year will be fifty. We'll be forty nine July twenty seventh. Okay. You got any big plans? No. No, not like really. You can share? No. Okay. No. All right. <laughs> um, you came to Christ uh, back in the day. Can you give us just a couple, maybe a paragraph of what that was like? Yeah, uh, I had a sociology teacher in high school that started to um, take an interest in wow, uh, sort of guide my life a little bit. Yeah. And uh, he <clears throat> he said to me, you've got uh, amazing potential, but you need to get right with God. Wow. And uh, everybody called him Brother Bob. He was yeah. also a weightlifting coach oh, for wow. the school. So okay. everybody kind of, all the guys thought, hey, you know. He's pretty cool. Brother Bob's cool, yeah. So yeah. anyway, he kind of... Uh, Took me and a few others under his wing, and we'd, okay. we'd go to his house and have a little Bible study. And but I was kind of anti-church. Yeah. Uh, but I'd been in a. My parents had split up, and I'd been in a real bad wreck, and it sort of upended and derailed my life. Yeah. And uh, this girl across the street kept inviting me to church. Okay. And I said, I'm not interested in church. Yeah. You know? But anyway, she kept inviting me. She and so finally she said, Well, we're having a. Uh, a youth group meeting at the, one of the sponsors' houses, right. they call them. And okay. uh, would you come to that? And I said, yeah, sure. So I uh, went to that, and, and they were so friendly and gracious and kind and welcoming. And uh, here, I want to tell you a story here. But yeah. So uh, I'm leaving that first meeting with okay. the youth group, and I'm walking down the driveway next to a brick house, right. and I, I rode a motorcycle there. Did you? I had a motorcycle. Sweet. And... Uh, this girl stops me, yeah. and she says, hey, I want to introduce myself. My name's, well, I won't mention her name, but yeah. let's just say girl. Yeah. <laughs> and she says, uh, hey, I just want to let you know it's good to meet you tonight. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. And I said, well, thanks. I appreciate that. And she stepped a little closer, and she said, and I uh, just wanted you to, to know. And I said, what? And she leaned forward and kissed me Did she on really? the lips. Wow. Yeah, this is a youth group meeting, first time visitor. And Look I, at you, I buddy. Thought, I thought, you know, church. Scoring. I thought church, <laughs> the first. church, not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, what have I been, what have I been missing uh, out on? Yeah. yeah. So anyway, we had a youth minister there. Wait, so this 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 girl that kissed you, it wasn't your wife? It wasn't my okay, wife. Okay, I appreciate no. you holding up on the was, name. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's right. And uh, so anyway, I, but that was my... First introduction about to that? a formal church. Sure. But uh, anyway, I started going, and the youth yeah. minister took me under his wing and picked me up uh, each week, took me to McDonald's one yeah. day a week. and uh, That's cool. And uh, so anyway, got in youth choir. Yeah. And uh, 
I was on the back riser, and Linda was uh -huh. uh, just uh, diagonally in front of me, yeah. one step down. Yeah. And I got interested in her. So uh, <laughs> one thing led to another. Two things led to each other. And, uh, <laughs> and there you go. 53 years ago. How about so, that, man? That's yeah. wild. How would you get called into ministry? What was that like for you? Did you, did you have somebody kind of speak things into your life or see things that you couldn't see? Did you, I mean, like for me, I, I, it, was a, it was a humanities teacher that brought world religion course to our class that actually created even more questions for me that actually led me to have more conversations with my youth pastor. Yeah. So in some ways, some similarities, but I, I had I went, there's no way I can go to Bible college. My youth pastor was like, you should go to Bible. I'm like, I just got a Bible. How can I, how can I go to Bible college? Just for people who yeah. you know, do Bible bowl their whole life and they know all the stories and yeah. how in the world. But how, how did that happen for you? Well, Brother Bob okay. was a big part of that. Okay. He, he got me involved in the Temperance League of Kentucky. He would, he would go with some other preachers on the weekend, okay. lay people. Okay. They'd speak in churches, talk okay. about alcohol, alcoholism. And then they would collect an offering and go back to the temperance league. And, sure. And so he asked me to to go on a couple of those and literally to speak sure. in these little country churches. You yeah. know, you go in and I'd get to ones that have like 16 people there or right. whatever, you know. And uh, and anyway, he kept uh, involving me and stuff. And then he asked me to preach at a little Baptist church in Louisville. You were in high school? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so wow. he... Uh, I wrote a sermon, no kidding. The title was Turn or Burn. Oh, gosh. Very loving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's fundamentalist Baptist. And, it's okay. Uh, they were used to it. <laughs> so uh, I preached it that night, and uh, it was a, I practiced it. It was 25 minutes, and I finished yeah. it in about 11. Gotcha. And I yeah. talked so fast. And, yeah. Uh, I was scared to do Told me everything you knew. <laughs> None of four friends came. None of them said great job afterwards. <laughs> Sweet. So I was going out it's the going back. Great. I was going out the back door, shaking people out. You know. Yeah. And uh, this little old guy comes up to me. Yeah. Had a cane. Little elderly man. Elderly man. And I was trying not to make eye contact with anybody because sure. I felt so ashamed. <laughs> and he took both 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 my hands and he yeah. looked me in the eye and he said, "Son, you're going to make a preacher someday." How about that? And uh, that's cool. That's the first time I think I ever felt God speaking to me. Wow. Never saw the man again. Sure. Walked out into the Didn't night. Didn't know his name. And yeah. But uh, wow. that was the beginning. Then decided to go to Bible college. And, yeah. And uh, Linda decided to go to Bible college. And you went to Cincinnati, right? I went to KCC. KCC, okay. KCU okay. now. Yeah, KCU. And yeah. Uh, it's funny because she was going to go to KCU and I was going to go to Cincinnati. Okay. And uh, when I found out, we, we talked it over and said, well, yeah. we'll go to the same school. Sure. Well, then her parents <laughs> uh, tried to assure that she would go to a different school. Oh, and, sorry. <laughs> and so they went ahead and enrolled her, and then I later changed where I was going to go and enrolled, oh. and so we dated through college. Took your talent somewhere else. Yeah, so you said uh, a short version, but that's, that's all right. That, that's that's good. That's good. What do you do in your current role? Uh, you got multiple things that you do. Um, yeah, well, I do. Uh, I mean, we won't even add. Yeah. I, I can't even get into the, today yeah. all the roles that you've had or even the places where you've been because you've got so many awesome stories. But what do you do now? I research and write. Yep. And so I, uh, you know, I work with John and Scott and other younger folks that yep. might need help. And then yep. we uh, we plan the messages. A lot of people aren't aware of this. We yep. plan at least six months in advance all the messages and yep. series. Yep. And uh, so I stay about a month ahead of them. Yeah. And then I look at the message like we're going to do three weeks from now. Right. And then I'll research it. Yeah. And then I'll literally write a sermon yeah. as if I were going to preach it. Now, they don't use my sermon. Sure. Never right. have. But And I've joined that teaching team now. Yeah. And it's been cool to watch you just dig out and go, hey, how can we help? You know, and it's, yeah. there's so much stuff there, which is really, really cool and gives them room. And yeah. sometimes they may use a chunk of it. They may use part of it. You know, if anything, it just may s yeah. cultivate the ground as they're thinking about what they're doing. But, yeah. yeah. We just want it to be a launching pad yep. to think about, you know, and talk about the text. And so yeah. that's what I do. And then I do illustrations and uh, research and always reading and yeah. researching for illustrations. You give John all his jokes? 
Uh, well, I'll give him a few here and there. But uh, <laughs> I've had so many people come up to me and go, hey, that was so funny, that little video yeah. we did. No, John, uh, he has a great sense of humor, and he, yeah. he's he got tons of material. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, he's fine. He's really more fun. interested in current events and yep. things that are happening that maybe he doesn't have time to look into. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, and I love it. Yeah. I love it. I've had nine positions to answer your other question. Nine positions. And, uh, here. Here, yeah. Yeah, so I won't get into all those. Yeah. 29 years, nine positions. 29 years, nine positions. If you don't like change, this is the wrong This is staff not to be the place on. to be. That's right. <clears throat> yeah. um, today's, today's two words is your enemy, mm-hmm. and we're going to talk about Satan and demons. Here's just a question for you. Any reason you think why I'd, I'd ask you to come be a part of today? <laughs> <laughs> Well, they're going to find out. I can yeah. tell you that. When I was in the counseling ministry, uh, <clears throat> I got involved in dealing with uh, demonic things. That yeah, people were telling me stories. They didn't teach you that in Bible college, right? You know, they like they, they they would deny that there were demons at all. Yeah, you know, yeah, that was all in Bible days. Yeah, but then I'd have, have people tell me stories. Yeah, real people, real things that happened. Sure, and they've never told anybody, and they. Yeah. They say, and I would say, well, if you can't come to the church, yeah, where can you go? Yeah, right. And so it yeah. caused me to have to learn a lot and get equipped and yeah. help. So I think you have amazing understanding on this topic, not just because of your own story, your education, or where you went to school. I think you just have learned a lot through the being in the blood and in the battle of people's stories. And so, you know, whether it's just been in the counseling area for you or whatever, but. You're, you're on a short list of people for me when it comes to seeking wisdom, battling hard circumstances, dealing with pain. We, we've gone to you. My wife and I have gone to you in different different times and places. I remember when we battled infertility, we went and spent some time with you guys. And and when I'm in a place where I'm going, I'm not sure about this, it's been fun to, to knock on your your door and to, to talk about this. So today we're going to unpack two words, your enemy. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure how long we'll take. We'll, we'll just dig it out. Yeah. Um, but there's an obvious thing that sticks out that we have an enemy and we actually have enemies and we'll just, we're just going to talk about the first one today, but the Bible tells us our enemies are Satan and demons. The, the world is also an enemy and then our own flesh. Mm-hmm. And we're not going to spend time in those, in those, those other two, but we're going to try to do a deep dive on Satan and demons today. And the reason that I think we should do this is that it's important. And whether you realize it or not, we're at war. And, you know, I have a, I have a, I have a couple different index cards in my, in my truck that are just visible for me to see. One of them is the word listen, just because I think there's, there's oftentimes where I'm talking to God and telling God about what I think he needs to do. And there's plenty of opportunities where I just need to listen there's some other prayer requests of people and specific things. And then there's another card that says, put on your armor, today is war. And because I need to be mindful of that for myself, for my family, for the people that I'm going to serve, for the teammates that I have, for our church, um, that type of thing. And so, and so, and what's interesting about this, I think sometimes in churches, we don't talk a whole lot about our enemy. So, so in that effort, we don't know our enemy. And, you know, I played sports. I, I, I love watching sports. And the reality is there's not a professional sporting team out there that doesn't review the tape to see the tendencies of weaknesses or strengths so that they can battle them. They right. can find holes. You know, I, I watch a lot of UFC, and it's interesting. I mean, I just watched a heavyweight uh, fight this this past weekend, and John Jones and Cyril Ghosn, Cyril Ghosn's unbelievable. And he's well-rounded, but he's not a good wrestler. And so John Jones hasn't fought for three years. John Jones has went from light heavyweight to heavyweight. And all of a sudden, it took about two minutes for him to wrestle Surreal Gone down because that was a weak area in his life. And he choked him out. And yeah. it was unbelievably fast. But because John Jones knew Surreal Gone's weaknesses, he was able to, to, to be victorious. And so hmm. if we got a chance at winning, we got to know our enemy. And so that's what we're going to do. I, I've, I've done a... I've done a lot of prep. You've done some prep here too. We both got our computers open. Um, it's just monumentally, monumentally important because we live in a world at war, and I don't mean with other countries. I mean with an enemy. And and this may be worth you grabbing some notes today if you're if you're if you're listening. Um, we're going to try to provide some things. If you want to watch, maybe this time there'll be some stuff on the lower third that you can capture as well. Scriptures points, maybe some questions. 
And, and whether you're in high school or a college student or young adult or a grown man, the stakes are really, really high and it matters because our goal, you know, God puts a lot of weight on us as responsibility to provide, protect, and to care for. Um, and so that's what we're going to do. So a little background just to get our, get us going. The Bible gives us some understanding, and this is, I'm just trying to squeeze some of this. There's there's plenty more to this, but God has always existed. He existed in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, he decided to create angels. They're created beings. They have free will. They're created to serve at the pleasure and the work of God. And underneath angels are humanity. That's us. It's human beings. We're on the same plane as angels are God. We're below them. The Bible doesn't say how many angels God created, but there are a lot of them. And at one time, there was an angel known as Lucifer. And the Bible refers to Lucifer as an angel of light. And he was beautiful and powerful and was revered by other angels. At some point in history, Lucifer decides he doesn't want to worship God anymore. And he doesn't want to bow at his throne. He wants God's throne. He wants to be worshiped and he wants to be served. And so um, Lucifer decides that he's going to, because he's created with free will, he's going to lead a coup in heaven and seek to overthrow uh, the one true God. And this all happens before the very first page mm-hmm. in the creation account in Genesis. And so there's a mu- multitude of verses. I just p- put one in here, but Revelation 12, 7 through 9, it says, There was war waged in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, meaning meaning Satan or Lucifer, and they lost their place in heaven. And the great dragon, another term mm-hmm. for him, was hurled down, and the ancient serpent, again, another term, called the devil or Satan, which leads the whole world astray, he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And so there's a lot there, and there's a we could spend a lot of time just in the origins of evil. Anything you want to say about that just as we kick off about that story that happens before the creation account in Genesis? It's real. The yeah. battle is real. Yeah. The enemy is real. Yeah. And uh, the one thing he wants us to do is not believe that. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Um, Satan has a lot of different roles, a lot of different names, um, and I, these will be hopefully on the screen and in the show notes, but descriptions of Satan, there's, there's, there's a bunch, you know, a serpent, Revelation 12, 9, I just read that evil one, Matthew 13, tempter, first Thessalonians 3, 5, liar and father of lies, John 8, 44, ruler of this world, John 12, 31, prince of the air, Ephesians 2, 2, an adversary, first Peter 5, 8. Um, the God little G of this world, Second Corinthians four four, the lawless one, Second Thessalonians two eighteen, Beelzebub, Matthew twelve twenty four, Belial, Second Corinthians six, um, the devil, Luke four thirteen, the great dragon, Revelation twelve, destroyer, Revelation nine eleven, murderer, John eight forty four. A lot of names, and there are other names. These this is not an exhaustive list. Any of those names or or certain names stick out to you? Like I I typically will just say your enemy. I don't like to. I don't like to say his name. I just like to say he's an enemy. I need to. I, yeah. I want to be mindful of that. Is there any names uh, of him that really speak to you, or as you think about him, these are kind of the names you typically use? Well, <clears throat> the one that stands out to me is the deceiver. Yeah. Uh, because here's the thing about deception: uh, you don't. If you don't know you're being deceived, yeah. you're deceived. Yeah. And so you have to know when you're being deceived. Yeah. And so he's really good at deception. Yeah. And um, it's kind of his number one tool in his toolbox, I think. Yeah. Um, and so the opposite of deception is believing the truth. Yeah. So you have this constant struggle between the God of truth yeah. and the uh, false God who traffics in deception. So yeah. he wants to deceive us. And that's good. I think that's a big part of his work. Jesus obviously believed in Satan and demons, and he says this in John 10, 10. It says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, and I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. What words stick out to you in this passage? I, you know, I always lean towards steal, kill, and destroy because I want them to understand that this is his mission statement. Um, those are the obvious ones, but are there other words that stick out to you? Well, the words before uh, steal, kill, and destroy are the thief. Yeah. And yeah. then the words after is, I have come, Jesus says, to give life yeah. that you might have it to the full. And yeah. so Abundance. the way he he steals is takes away the the life that God gives us and yeah. all the everything that surrounds that life. Yeah. And he deceives us uh, in the process to believe that none of that is 
necessary or none of that is essential or real. Yeah. And so he puts this false life in front of us yeah. and uh, deceives us into believing it's the best way to live. And we miss out on all of what God exactly. wants for us. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, deception, deceiver is the one that stands out for okay. me. Yeah. Um, let's talk, let's oscillate into the, 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 the word demons. Um, you know, it, we, we don't hear a ton about this, but as you read the gospel spe- specifically, mm-hmm. you see it everywhere. Um, yeah. And so are demons real? What, what are they? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, evil spirits are mentioned about 200 times in the New Testament, and Satan or demon or Satan himself is mentioned about 120 times. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people don't realize that. Right. If you read the Gospel of Mark, yeah. half the chapters in the Gospel of Mark mention evil spirits or demons. And yeah. so, uh, you know, people just aren't aware. Being aware is important. But I think... Uh, when you when you think about demons, uh, everybody tends to go to is he demon possessed? Right, right. You know they think of the Exorcist movie yeah. and all of that. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think uh, you don't find for one thing you don't find the word demon possession in the in the New Testament. Yeah. In the Greek, it's mm. uh, and which means demonized. Yeah. And it means that a person is under the influence. Yeah. Of a demon, it could be at any level. Yeah, but you don't have uh, the kind of thing you see in some of the movies and right. things on television. But uh, Satan's ways to attack us are are pretty direct. Uh, demons disrupt. Mm. If you think about Paul when he said to the Thessalonians, more than once, I tried to visit you, but Satan hindered me. Yeah, and here's an Apostle Paul. Yeah, you know, and Satan yeah. disrupts his plans, and so. Yeah. In Daniel, it talks about, uh, you know, God sent a messenger to, to to Daniel, but the Bible says the messenger was delayed for 21 days by a demonic spirit that resisted. Battle. You know, so uh, disruption. Uh, secondly, they deceive us. Mm. Uh, as I've talked about, that's one of the common words for Satan in the Bible. Yeah. The Bible calls him a liar and the father of lies. And uh, so... You know, like I say, if you're deceived uh, and you don't know you're deceived, you're, you're cannon fodder yeah. for the enemy. Yeah. Um, they piggyback on our damaged emotions. Um, you know, they, uh, they want to take the pain that you've had in your life and piggyback on that and, and make how you interpret it worse than ever yeah. you imagined it could be. Yeah. Uh, so disruption, deception... Uh, piggybacking on our emotions, destroying us. They want to destroy our sanity, our relationships, our devotion to God. Yeah. Um, all those things are are real, but yeah. I would say that uh, we shouldn't be alarmed. We should right. be equipped, yeah. and there's a big difference between yeah. the two. And yeah. we have no logical reason to fear right. Satan right. Uh, because God is in us and he's greater. Yeah, you know, Absolutely. Satan's a defeated enemy, as you pointed out. Right, and so uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, just some thoughts. Um, you know, it, the difference between demonized and demon oppressed. You know, we've uh, maybe just for a second. It's it's if you're a Christian, a Christ follower, it, it really is difficult for me to find any scripture that says that Satan or de- a demon can live inside of you because the Holy Spirit resides there. Where yeah. the Holy Spirit resides. You, he doesn't get to, they don't get to play. Um, but it's those who are demonized, that's, that's more of a, a situation where maybe they're not, they're not Christians, um, whether it's addiction or some, some sort of habitual sin or some deep seated wound, those type of things. Anything to, to add to that? Well, um, it's true that a, a demon can't possess your spirit. Yeah. Your spirit was regenerated when you became a Christian, and right. the Holy Spirit lives there now. Right. But your soul, which is your mind, your will, your emotions, yeah. he can find ground there yeah. to stand in any of those areas, and your body, yeah. which is the external part of yes. everything. And uh, so he typically attacks us through our mind, yeah. the battle is for the mind, yeah. our will, Mm-hmm. Whether we're submitted to God or not, yeah. our emotions, whether yeah. they're controlled by the Holy Spirit, yeah. or our body, the yeah. physical man, yeah. and so uh, most of the demonic stuff that I've seen falls in those areas, and 
Uh, yeah, you're correct. He can't possess yeah. a Christian. Yeah. But he can't oppress yeah. a Christian, and that's important to know. Yeah, yeah. Some misconceptions in our world around Satan and demons. Um, one is Satan and God are equal. You know, if you've watched cartoons, you see Tom and Jerry or Bugs Bunny or whatever, and you see an angel and a demon, and they're the same size and all those things. Or there's this yin yang mentality that people have, or or we just think that Satan and God are on the same plane. And even though there's a true God and a false God, they're not the same, not even close. Satan is created being. God is not a created being. God's eternal, and he's always existed. God's omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, all-present. Satan and demons are not all-powerful. They're powerful, but they're not all-powerful. And Satan and demons have studied mankind, and they, they'll use what they can. They've studied our game tape. Uh, they want us to try and destroy what God's doing in our lives. Uh, they're not all-present everywhere at all times. Uh, they, operate, uh, in, they operate in demonic spiritual bodies that are finite or limited by space and time. Anything you want to say to that, just about how they're not equal? Well, I think you, you make a good point. When you, when you think about God, God is omnipotent, which mm -hmm. means he's all-powerful, Yeah, which means he has all the power there is, Right. which means he can do anything as easily as he can do anything else. Yeah. So he's omnipotent. He's omnipresent, which means he's everywhere all the time. Yeah. Satan is not all-powerful. Right. Satan cannot be everywhere all the time. That's yeah. why he uses demons to... Yeah you know, accomplish some of his purpose. It's probably why I say enemy a lot, because I don't always yeah. know if Satan's, if it's Satan. Right. But it's it's that team, you yeah. know, and so that's why I probably use the, the word generally for enemy when it yeah. comes to that. But keep right. going, sorry. Yeah, well, God is omniscient and Satan isn't. Yeah. Satan can't read your mind. Right. He can put thoughts in your mind. And Absolutely. Make, here's his trick. He puts a thought in your mind, maybe mm -hmm. a self-condemnatory thought. Yeah. And he makes you think it's coming from you. Yeah. So you live under guilt and shame. Yeah. That's his trick. Toxic thoughts. Uh, but he can't know everything. Uh, yeah, I like to speak out uh, yeah. what I'm out loud. thinking and praying. Yeah. Because I want the enemy to hear yeah. the truth from me rather than, you know. It's a great practice for, yeah. for men. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm with yeah. you. Um, here's another misconception. Satan doesn't exist. You know, there's so many polls out there that Americans and American Christians struggle to believe that Satan's a, a real living thing. Demons are real living things. Um, and that's a problem. You know, it's like, I think about like when I was in middle school, when you know that you have a bully and you know that they're going into the bathroom, you're not going to go in the bathroom. Yeah. Or you're not going to yeah. sit by them at lunch. You're going to avoid that hallway. And if we refuse to believe that he exists, we're, in, we're, we're, we're losing this battle over and over again. And I love this quote from, it's the movie Usual Suspects. It says, the greatest trick that they ever, ever pulled was convincing the world that he doesn't exist. Yeah. That's, that's magic, yeah. you know. Um, well, he wins. Yeah. Uh, if you don't think he exists, he wins. You know, all of his objectives are easily accomplished. Easily, yeah. So, uh, you know, the first thing you need to do if you're a believer is understand we have a real enemy. Mm-hmm. We have a real battle. Yeah. The war is on. Yeah. We're not 10 soldiers. Yeah. We're children of the king. We need to equip ourselves. We need to fight the fight. Yeah. You know, all the scriptures in the New Testament talk about standing against, fighting the fight, the good Aggressive. fight, to, yeah. you know, and we need to do that. If we're not doing that, we're uh, essentially he doesn't, we're no threat to him. Right. And so he just ignores us. Sure. You know. Yeah. yeah. This kind of spurs off the first one, the first misconception that Satan's everywhere. Um, sometimes you'll run into people, I run into people too, where they're like, everything that happens wrong in their life is Satan. You know, it's like the old sketch on uh, Dana Carvey on Saturday Night's like, could it be Satan? You know? <laughs> right. And so like, you know, you have car trouble. Maybe, maybe the enemy did that, or maybe you just got to, uh, it's time to fix your car, you know? Or, you know, I get migraines a lot. And, you know, could could he do that? I mean, he's in. He he has some authority in the physical world, um, but I don't know that every time I had I had probably five migraines last week, and 
it could just be the pressure outside. It could just be my sinuses. It could be the lack of sleep or stress that I carry. It could be lots of different things. Yeah, right. We we sometimes <clears throat> like to label it. Or, hey, you get a leak in your roof or you sprain your ankle or you lose your job. It's like maybe Satan had nothing to do with that. Um Maybe it's just time for you to get your car fixed or your roof's 23 years old, man. It's time. I mean, you, you know, whatever that is, you sprain your ankle, you just, you just had an accident, you know, you fell. But I'm not saying that Satan can't do those things. He can, but typically his threats seem to be more personal and more impactful. Um, yeah. And we drive in perfect cars, we live in perfect homes, and we have in perfect bodies. But here's the, thing, here's the thing that's interesting, I think. Even if he doesn't create those things, he's not the initiator of those things, he will work in spite of those things or because of those things to discourage us. You know, Maybe he wasn't directly involved in your car issue, but he wants to bring blanket you with discouragement or maybe money's tight. He wants your stress level to go up or, or, or whatever that is. He'll, he'll try to create fear or try to get you to sin or cause you to doubt God's goodness, you know, you're trying to do the right things. God obviously doesn't love you because all these things are happening to you. When actually the scriptures say, it's life is going to happen to you. We live in the world and we're not of this world. But anything to add to that? I mean, he he may not be directly responsible for something, but he he can work indirectly through it to to attempt to 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 steal, kill, and destroy, or to rob us of, of sure. God or create doubt. Well, I think Jesus presents a good example of that when, uh, you know, Peter is um, telling yeah. him, Lord, we'll, we'll never let this happen. We're not going <laughs> to let yeah. you be crucified. Never gonna take, yeah, yeah. You remember, Jesus just looked at him and said, get thee behind me, Satan. Yeah, yeah. And so a spiritual person who is walking under the influence of the Holy Spirit sees a lot, mm -hmm. corrects a little. Yeah. And... Uh, overlooks a lot and sure. you know I don't, I don't say everything's a demon yeah you know if, if you tell me you've had five mi migraines i say you need to get see a, a yeah, doctor that's right you know that's right yeah or you know you need to wait and see if it happens again next week or yeah. next month yeah uh but you know i don't um I don't look at everything as an attack from the enemy. Yeah. Most of the problems I have, I created. Yeah, you know, right. yeah, and right. uh, my own negligence. Hey, that light was on. That angel yeah. light was on in my car for four weeks. Yeah, you know, or whatever. the twenty-three yeah. year old roof is is not a demon. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. uh, it's, it's a, a twenty year old roof. Yeah, twenty three year old roof. So yeah. uh, most of our physical ailments are, you know, physiological, not spiritual. But yeah, I will say that uh, you know there can be some. Some uh, there are organic and there are spiritual causes to sure. lots of things. Yeah, and discernment is learning how to tell which is which. Yeah, you you wanted to make sure we talked about this. Why do we need to know about spiritual warfare? It's a big one. Yeah, well, because it's happening all the time. Yeah, because all of Scripture presents this cosmic war yeah. going on between God and Satan, and God and His angels, Satan and His angels. And, uh, you know, the book of Job says that um, Satan roams throughout all the earth looking for opportunities to destroy mm -hmm. God's children, Job chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, and so the, the battle is real. We need to know how to fight the battle. Yeah. You know, a soldier is not a soldier until he fights. Yeah. You know, and uh, you don't know if he's a good soldier until he knows how to fight. That's right. And so we have to know. Uh, it's pretty much that simple. Gotcha. Yeah. Taking our authority in spiritual realms. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Well, uh, most of the things that <clears throat> go on in the spiritual realm, uh, you know, the scripture talks about forces of darkness and evil. And mm -hmm. this is Ephesians 6, 12, the rulers, authorities, spiritual forces in heavenly places. Uh, Paul says we wrestle with those things, those things, which means he expects us to wrestle. Yeah. He says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. He expects us to be yeah. strong. Yeah. And so every day he tells us to put on all the armor, yeah. you know, the helmet, the breastplate. Yeah. By the way, in all that list of armor, the sword, the spirit, and so on, there's no protection for the backside. Yeah. It's all advancing. Yeah. And uh, there's nothing in that list in Ephesians 6 to cover your backside. Yeah. So yeah. we're to be engaging. Yeah. The enemy, and so the way I look at it is, where today can I enforce the power of the cross? Yeah, 
You know, there's one drop of the blood of Jesus mm -hmm. can cover all of our sins. There's yeah. power in the blood, as the sure. song used to be. Absolutely. And so we are enjoined in partnership with the Holy Spirit to enforce the power of the cross. Yeah. And we ought to be doing that. And, uh, you know, you can do that in small ways. You can do that in big ways. But right. I think the way we do it is we give glory to God. Sure. And we don't go around and pretend that we're, you know, ghostbusters or demon right. busters or right. whatever. And chasing the stuff, sure. I have no power ap right. apart from Christ. Yeah. Zero. You're going to lose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you don't take his authority. Yeah. yeah. He, that, that comes with his power. We yeah. don't have his power. We have his authority. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, some weapons that are typical weapons for the enemy. Uh, these are the these are the lists that I've kind of tried to think through as I equip men. But the first one, again, there's, there, there's not necessarily any order, but lies. You know, he loves to lie. Um, it says that he's the father of lies. He'll lie about you. He'll lie about God. He'll twist Scripture to believe certain things, just like in in the the very first. Uh, Temptation scene in in the creation account. Did God really say that? You yeah. know all those things. <clears throat> the lie. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, it says that lying is his, is is his native tongue, and if he can get you to exchange the truth for lies, he's got us. You right. know. You mentioned deception. You know. He's such a master manipulator. You know. It's like the scriptures in Proverbs where it says there the, there's a way that seems right to a man but at the end leads to death. It's like, feels right, seems right, and the reason is is because I've been deceived. Right. And the reality is I can talk myself into something, anything, or out of anything. And the enemy is very easy to do that, plant seeds, this is your, you deserve this, whatever that looks like, he'll, he'll do that. And, and you know, he, he tries to downplay things like, hey, it's not that big a deal. You, nobody's gonna know. Nobody's gonna. Nobody's gonna care. Or, or don't tell anybody. Or you got this. You deserve this. No, this will make it better. Uh, it's what everybody else does. He just deceives us and yeah. big time. And then temptation. Um, he loves to attract us or entice us or lure us or seduce us with the promise of something that just like in the just like in the very first sin that happens, you know, it, it looks and feels and seems good. And then throw in lies and deception, and then we we bite and we sin. Uh, look at porn, or lie to protect yourself, or gossip about, or prod up, or you know, take yeah. another drink. Whatever works. And the, and the reality is, he he's so crafty. But you know what? If if the same thing will work, he'll just keep doing it, right? Yeah. He'll just keep using yeah. it. Whether that's fear or anxiety or or gambling or whatever the addiction or proclivity might be, he knows where we've been. They've watched us. And they also study mankind, and they see where pride takes men, or they see where anger takes men, and so they they know those things. And so, so if they can get us to step over a line, crossing lines of conviction and and from temptation that moves us to sin, then they've got us, you know. And so then from there, it's interesting accusation. As soon as we cross over that line, almost almost instantaneously, not always, but almost instantaneously, we go, oh, I can't believe you did that, man. Yeah. Like yeah. what you were you were trying to get me to do this, you know? Yeah. And it's like shame, man. I mean, he'll just yeah. accuse. He'll try to blanket us with shame, take us out to the deep waters, and drown us in shame and disgrace and humiliation. And he'll lie and say, "I can't believe you did that. You're you're terrible. You're you're a piece of crap. You're disgusting. You better keep this underground. Don't talk to anybody. Don't talk to God about it. You're a horrible Christian. You're garbage. God couldn't forgive you of this. I mean, just just." just layering us with accusation and then condemnation, which is even more that, you know, God can't forgive you. He hates you. He's not for you. And he just keeps dropping these bombs. And what happens is, is that we, because of sin or habitual sin, we end up in a place where we feel accused and then we believe the lies. Yeah. And the biggest lies that God couldn't forgive us. You yeah. Know? And then there are plenty of people that even go, you know, what? I'm, 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 I've lived in so much shame. I'll just take my life, you know? Right. Another one's fear. He's a terrorist. Um, he wants us to live in fear. There is no greater time in the world today when it comes to fear and anxiety and worry than, than in our day. And he wants us to live unstable, insecure, and anxious. He wants to fear everything, everybody, other races, mm -hmm. um, people who are different. Right. Fear him, fear God, live in fear. Fear failure, yeah. fear of rejection, fear of love, fear 
of the church, um, he'll ambush us with fear. He'll he'll create a powerless person, and they want he wants to choke the courage out of us. You know, um, go anywhere you want to with those those six things, man. Uh, C.S. Lewis, I think it was his book, The Great Divorce, but I'm not positive. But he uh, he tells this story about um, uh, people in heaven yeah. and hell, and they can see each other. And, uh, and so some of the people from heaven uh, and the people in hell come up to the gate of heaven, okay. some of them. And somebody goes out who's who's a christian and says why don't you come in yeah you know this is this is where god is and yeah and the guy says well i've got this rat on my shoulder and uh we're very good friends and you know i need to bring him in with me if i can yeah you know and the rat is saying all the time to this guy you know yeah. you don't want to do this you don't want to right you know don't go in yeah. this is all ridiculous and, yeah. and finally the the christian it persuades him to to yeah. get rid of the rat yeah. and come in. Yeah. And so finally the guy takes the rat off his shoulder and throws it down in the ground yeah. to kill it. Yeah. And as soon as it hits the ground, it turns into this majestic horse, this stallion. Wow. And the Christian and the guy from hell get on the stallion and ride through the, the gates into heaven. And yeah. you know, the point of his story is we all have this this rat, as yeah. it were, yeah. And if we listen to him, he'll destroy us. Yeah. And so, the thing we need to do is focus on the truth. Again, the battle is for the mind. Yeah. And what does God say about you? Yeah. And what will God do for you? And how will He guide you? And how will He serve and love and extend grace to you? How He will carry you? Yeah. How He will empower you and equip you? You know, so we don't want to focus on the enemy. Correct. Um, when we know the winner, yeah. we know who wins the war. Totally. You we know, know this movie ends. But we just have to be aware. Yeah. And if we got a rat. We have to know this book. Yeah. We yeah. Have we have to book. know the word, and yeah. it's the sword of the spirit. The yeah. word of God is Ephesians yeah. six, and so you know uh, we we stand on that. The battle is for the mind. Tell ourselves the truth. The truth is found in the word. Don't listen to the lies, yeah. or we'll become victims of the lies. Yeah. That's self condemnation. That's a shame, yeah. which is one of his greatest inroads in into people's lives. Yeah. So, anyway, huge. You you said let, you, you, when we were talking before, you were like, "Hey, let's make sure we talk about this." Um, why do so many Christ followers struggle spiritually? And I know that there's a lot of reasons why, but you you've thought a little bit about this. Why, why do you think they struggle so much spiritually? Well. You know, I talked about the, the different parts of us, the, the mind, the will, the emotions, mm -hmm. the body. When we become a Christian, the spirit yeah. is regenerated. Yeah. We've gone from being lost to saved. We've gone from being dead to being alive. But a lot of other things aren't immediately regenerated. Yeah. The mind is not immediately right. regenerated. That takes time. Sanctification process. Right. We might harbor unforgiveness toward people. Yeah. Uh, we don't really understand our new identity in Christ. We're learning who we're we learning are. Learning who we are. Yeah. Uh, we live with feelings. We've learned to do that rather than truth. Yeah. Uh, we haven't learned to take each thought captive, as the Bible tells us to do. Yeah. Each thought captive. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we don't understand the tactics of the enemy. Yeah. And so, being a Christian, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a bigger list as to why it gets right? the spirit regenerated. But yep. the rest is a work in progress, and that's why yep. you know all the writing in the New Testament talks about fight the good fight, yep. engage the enemy, uh, yep. set your mind on things above, right. uh, resist this and this and this, and follow this and this and that. And so it's uh, it's a process. Yeah, you know the Christian uh, Christian life's not. Uh, a difficult life. It's an impossible life. That's that's great. That's and, great. And there's only one there. person yeah. that ever lived it. Yeah, that's and right. that's Jesus. That's right. <laughs> and so I tell people, you know, just hang out and stay close to Him. Yeah, and just be like Him. Yeah, do what He does. Say what He says. Yeah, He's He's your guide, and, and you'll be fine. Yeah, I, I think I think 
the, sometimes people either they just don't like to read or they they they're overwhelmed by this book. And again, I I don't ever tell, I started at the very beginning when I first got it when I was seventeen. And it was not the right way to start from the very beginning and just read through. And so I, I, I will tell people to start with the Gospels now. But but I think people think it's it's about being religious. It's like it really has nothing to do with that. I need to have time with Jesus, and he has given us this gift. This I mean, he could have said, hey, listen, I hope you find me. And he's like, well, he's given us this gift of, of knowing who he is and who we are because of him and what he's done for us and what he promises us and what's— what happens when life happens, and and that the fact that we have it's all in here, and so taking the time daily, and regardless of how much time you spend or how much you read, to daily connect with him, just it makes us mindful and aware of what he wants to do in our life, and then what's out there, so that we can we can take our stand or we can fight against him. I think that's that's super yeah. important. And if you're going to be in a battle, you have to have a battle plan, yeah. and uh, the scriptures are the battle plan. Totally, that tell us how to. Live a victorious life. Yeah, how to win. And uh, so, you know, if I were the enemy, I wouldn't want anybody to read the Bible. Yeah. And so I would just ask myself. Uh, You're too busy. Look you at know, your phone. Be distracted. Am I falling in, uh, <clears throat> into the enemy's trap by not reading the Word? Yeah. And I don't like to read Leviticus or Deuteronomy or yeah. some of those. But like you say, the Gospels. Yeah. I live in the Gospels. Yeah. I yeah. live in the Psalms. Sure. I like the book of James because it's practical wisdom for so. daily life, yeah. you know. Yeah. I like Philippians because it's about joy yeah. and rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I like yeah. Romans. Yeah. I like chapter 15, verse 13, where it says, May the God of hope yeah. fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him and yeah. so that you may overflow with hope yeah. through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the stuff you get in the Bible. We get anchored. Yeah. No. And so, you know, you, you can't have a strong Christian uh, identity, first of all, yeah. or life without knowing Scripture. Yeah, it's the Word of Life. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, anyway. Yeah, yeah. The you just mentioned identity. Um, why? Is there, there's so many times where either the enemy is trying to attack God's identity for us. Or he goes after our our identity, and and I I immediately was drawn to Matthew four where he's um, where he's he's being tempted in the desert, hadn't eaten for forty days, and twice out of those temptations it says, "If you are the Son of Man," he's trying to coax him or manipulate him him into doing something, but he's attacking Jesus at his as identity. Why is that important that the enemy does that for us? What happens when we when we get lost when it comes to who we are in Christ and we, we, we get confused or we don't believe it? Well, God made us to have intimate fellowship with him. Yeah. And he sent Christ to make a pathway, the way, the truth, and the life, right. to have that intimate fellowship. So anytime he can get us to uh, walk in a different direction, he's happy. Yeah. And... Um, I don't know what your what was your specific question. Just about when you don't know who you are. Yeah. Christ. Okay. So yeah. If, if you if you don't know who you are, you you don't know what you are. Yeah. That's and good. Uh, so, you know, you need to learn your identity in Christ. I'm a child of God. I'm holy and completely loved. Yeah. Uh, I'm forgiven. Uh, I'm guided. Yeah. Uh, I'm strengthened, and so on and so forth. When you when you know those things, you know what you are in Christ. Yeah. Because you know who you are in Christ. Yeah. And you so you know what the benefits are. Yeah. And uh, you're you're living according to your identity. Right. And so everybody has an identity, whether it's a biblical identity. Right. Or a man-made identity. Yeah. Uh, so I, you know, I think the power for for life comes in our identity in Christ. Yeah. Nowhere else. Yeah. When I understand I'm adopted into his family, that right. he's chosen me, yeah. that I am dearly, unconditionally, and ferociously loved, Yeah. it changes me. Yeah. It does. Transformational. Absolutely. Yeah. Truth yeah. is that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Um, desires. Um, we live in a world right now, man, whatever you want, whatever's going to make you happy— um, and it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's around sexuality or Id- identity or gender. Um, why? Why is it 
why should we go? I can't. I cannot chase my desires. Why? Why is that important for us to to understand and know? Why is that? We have to know what we believe mm-hmm. uh, to handle our desires. Again, we yeah. go back to and we have good desires and bad, and we have evil right, desires in us right. too. Right. And so, yeah, and you, you know, part of the Christian walk is sorting through your desires yeah. and uh, learning what's of God and what isn't, what's yeah. righteous and what's unrighteous, and right. Uh, but we are still flesh. <clears throat> the body hasn't been redeemed yet. It will be at the second coming. In some ways, a civil war between what the spirit wants to do in us and right. what our flesh wants to do. Yeah, the spirit and the flesh. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, you don't beat yourself up when you lose a battle. You yeah. just get back in the game. Get up. And uh, so, you know, Satan loves to put us under condemnation. Yeah. And if he can keep us there, he's quite happy. Yeah. And so you, you don't want to live that way. Yeah. Yeah. Footholds and strongholds are big Bible words. Um, unpack just a little bit of it. Well, Ephesians 4, 26, I think it says, uh, don't be angry lest you give the devil a foothold. foothold. Yeah. And so literally it means a place to stand. It's kind of like it comes from the the warfare yeah. practice where you storm the beach. Mm-hmm. And you, you get on the beach and you establish a foothold yeah. so you can fight further. Yeah. But a stronghold becomes something that is entrenched. Yeah. And from a negative perspective, a stronghold is anything that has a stronghold yeah. over you. Yeah. And so uh, footholds is giving Satan a place to stand. Stronghold is giving Satan a place to live yeah. in your life. That's good. Say that again. With strongholds and footholds. First one, stand and then live. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know, you know, that's just a thought. Yeah. Uh, some of the stuff I'm saying right now, yeah, foot, I'd have to foot parse are it out places a little where bit. he can stand, yeah, and right. strongholds are places where he can live and dominate. Yeah, a foothold is maybe uh, having a cocktail. Mm-hmm. A stronghold is becoming an alcoholic. Right. And, uh, right. you know, you can't have the stronghold unless you establish a foothold. Yeah. So you have to be, do all things in moderation, the scripture says, yeah. not excess. Right. And uh, excess is usually a stronghold. Um, some of these areas, habitual sin, wounds, or lies that we believed, how does that, how does that kind of intersect with footholds and strongholds? Well, it makes us live under condemnation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, forgiveness, for instance, is a, is a is a good example. I had a lady come in my office one time, and she uh, uh, she was carrying a letter. Mm-hmm. It was all crumpled up, mm. and she was fumbling around as she was talking to me. And uh, she said, "I've had this letter for for four years, and I've read it." A lot. I said, "Well, how? What's a lot?" And she said, "I don't know, thirty, forty times, probably." Okay. And uh, <coughs> I said, "Well, why don't you? Uh, why don't you do something? Why don't you give me the letter?" Yeah. Oh no, she said, "I can do that." You know, I, um, I, I just, I, I came here to get some advice, but I, I don't want to give the letter away. And I said, "Well, give me the letter." Yeah. And she reached out. She said, what are you going to do with it? And I said, what I do with it is important. What you do with it yeah. is important. Give me the letter. Sure. She handed me the letter. And then uh, I said, now you've given me the letter. Are you willing to give up the grudge? Hmm. And uh, so I let her through a prayer of forgiveness. Yeah. And uh, she released the bitterness and the unforgiveness that it kept her in bondage basically for three yeah. years and from being wounded yeah and and then you know I said so now you're free yeah you're free yeah you've 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 given up the grudge yeah you've forgiven right and uh, you're free she never asked about the letter again how about that ever yeah. and uh, of course I tore it up and threw it away yeah 
And, but anyway, I, I'm diverging from no, whatever we were no, talking about. No, but, but it, this is what I do. It's, but it's it's a strong so, that's that became yeah. a stronghold. Yeah, she right. was wounded that, by somebody. Someone point. wrote a letter, yeah. mm-hmm. and, or or it was her letter, and all these feelings that just reside. Yeah, exactly. Never live. I mean, never, never, never go away. They just it's it's like. It's like it, it, it's an, an incubation thing where it's just growing everywhere, yeah. and it yeah. just it takes over people. Yeah. And forgiveness is hard, but it yeah. matters. And for us to know how much we've been forgiven, and then also the call in our lives to forgive, and it's not a feeling; it's a decision and a choice. And the cool thing about Jesus is that Jesus will give us the ability to do that. Yeah, in spite of our feelings, I'm never going to wake up. And go, you know what I feel like doing today? I feel like forgiving that dude or myself yeah. because of you know no, it's it's going, I'm choosing his truth. And I'm 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 also giving that stuff to Jesus and letting Jesus and that person work that out. Yeah. Well somebody asked me the other day, uh, you know, we were talking about forgiveness and they said, Well, I you know, I've forgiven this person yeah. fifteen times. Yeah. But I still feel bitterness. Yeah. What do I do? I said, keep forgiving. Keep going. That's right. Keep <laughs> you know, going. you keep, you, you, as William James used to say, act as if. Act as if. And yeah. uh, then eventually what you, your actions will be correct. Yeah. And so forgiveness is a process, like you say, and yeah. it's uh, um, total forgiveness. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you how, how you can tell if you've totally forgiven a person is you're in a conversation with somebody. Yeah. And you know... Uh, that the person you've forgiven has wronged them. Yeah. And they're telling you how, you know, whatever sure. the hurt they are. And you don't say anything negative about yeah. the guy that you've forgiven. Yeah. yeah. That's, to, that's total forgiveness. Yeah. And uh, that's what we want to strive toward. Right. And how do you do that? You just keep forgiving. Yeah. And you give it up to God over and over. Yeah. It goes away. There are married men that listen to this. There are divorced men that listen to this. There are men that have had affairs. There are, are men whose wives have had affairs on them. And, and you know, it's not simply throwing a Band-Aid on something. Hey, just forgive them. And sometimes it's a one-time thing that you can forgive and release. Yeah. And sometimes it's a moment-by-moment thing. And if you're trying to repair a marriage or whatever, I mean, there's so much stuff that creeps in and can can either trigger or, you know, if you just watch TV at night from 8 o'clock on, you're going to see somebody hooking up with somebody. And so the reality is you're going to have to, and you mentioned this, and we'll we'll even dig this out more in a few minutes, but to take every thought captive, we'll we'll dig that out more in a minute, but how important that is. You know, even I've had couples that I've ministered to that come into church and and then just so happens that John and Scott are talking about something, and it may not even be that specific topic, but this thing comes up, and and there's something in them that, Oh gosh, and it's like we're just you're just walking through it. And listen, the more you talk through this, the more that you begin to release this stuff to the Lord, the easier it becomes. But it will take time, and trust will be restored, and and wounds will be healed, and marriages can be rebuilt stronger than ever. But it will take time. You know that matters. It's work. It's work. It's sweat. Right. Love isn't sweet. It's sweat. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. If you think it's sweet, you're gonna. Yeah. You won't be married too long. You yes. realize. <laughs> That's right. That doesn't count. That's you right. Know, it's more than that. I asked the question, how do we battle the enemy? And I, I I, just gave a list of things, and I'll touch them. If you want to jump in, then feel free to. I just It starts with our relationship with Jesus. It starts with us knowing him, understanding who he is and what he's done for us. Us knowing uh, the, the gift that we have in prayer to be able to talk to him at any time, in any place. He's always available. Um, even when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit will pray on behalf of us. And I, I told this, these to guys the other night, yeah. there are prayers that come out of me, that have come out of me in my life, that I haven't said. Yeah. And that's pretty, that's pretty profound to think yeah. that the God who lives inside of me, when I don't know what to pray, or I'm so hurt or so broken, will then intercede for me, talk to the Father on behalf of me, because He knows my needs. It's yeah. such a cool thing. Um, being in God's Word and being anchored in truth, Truth can can extinguish the lies that come from the enemy. Ephesians 6 talks about the shield of faith, all these things where we can extinguish the arrow, the flaming arrows that come, that come our way. Um, understanding more and more about the Holy Spirit. I'm sure we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit in the future, even just a deep, deeper dive on him. But 
what a gift the Holy Spirit is in our lives to, he does a million things, yeah. you know, and he's so under underutilized in our lives, but to begin to walk in the Spirit, to begin to listen to the Spirit, to let the Spirit speak and and lead us in places and, and convict us at times, but to prompt us in great ways for, for greater work and kingdom impact is, is huge. Practicing repentance and confession daily or moment by moment. You know, sometimes we'll just kind of say these prayers at dinner time, like, hey, Lord, thank you for this food and forgive us of all of our sins. It's like, I mean, that's okay, but when you actually say, hey, Lord, I just need you to forgive me right now for the pride that I have. I just, I pride it up and I was, I made it about me yeah. and I'm sorry. Right. Or, man, God, I was looking through my phone and I saw something and my mind went to a place and I lusted and I'm I'm sorry. Right. I, I, I never want to... I never want to go there. And so I'm turning from that. And I'm trusting you. Please forgive me. Um, help me to be more mindful and to be strong to, enough to recognize these temptations so I don't go back down the street. Whatever it is, but just daily acknowledging those things moment by moment. So that way there's there's nothing that stays inside of us. So that way those those footholds, you know, we they get released. And there's there's never hopefully a chance for them to actually take us to the ground with a stronghold. You yeah, know what I mean? Right. Uh, I think with prayer, um, we make the mistake of praying for people. Sometimes they'll come to us and say, I, you know, this has happened, that's happened, yeah. uh, I did this, I did that. Yeah. Will you pray for me? Yeah, I love and, this about you. I've heard the story. Tell them. And uh, I had a guy come one time to the prayer rooms here, and he, he said, uh, you know, I, I need you to pray for me. Yeah. And uh, I said, well, what have you done? He said, well, I'm a you know, this, that, I'm sure. and it had a long list. And I said, why don't you pray? Yeah. He said, I don't know how to pray. Yeah. And I said, well, I'll help you. Yeah. You know, I said, just, you know, say, Father, um, thanks for listening to me. I know you love me. Yeah. And then just tell him what's on your heart. Yeah. And then I said, when you're done, I'll finish. I said, go ahead, pray. Yeah. And so he started in, God, I'm a blankety blank 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 blank. Yeah. God, a blankety blank. Yeah. And the the first three minutes was just, <laughs> you know, <laughs> profanity. And sure, uh, sure. but he was being honest with God, yeah. you know. And God's uh, not freaking out. And he he prayed for like, I don't know, five minutes, seven minutes. It was Never. it was a long time. Yeah. And by the time he finished, he was saying, "I know you love me. I love you." Isn't that crazy. I don't know how. Now, what if I just prayed for him? I know, man. What an opportunity yeah. for that dude to know that, you yeah. know, and I can take what I have yeah. to my father, and I can bring all that I am and the way that I feel, and he's not going to yeah. turn from me. Yeah, it's one know. of the best prayers I ever heard. Isn't it awesome? You know? Yeah. <laughs> so we we Christians make a mistake of praying yeah. for each other too much. Yeah. And you only understand what I mean by that in that yeah. context. Absolutely. Um, and you joined with him in prayer. But, yeah, but absolutely. But you, you initiated him. Yeah, yeah. I think so So often we're worried about how it's going to sound. It's like, just pray what you got. You and I are just talking. Yeah. It's not been perfect. We're not perfect. Right. But right. who cares? We have a friendship and a relationship, and we care for each other. And and I don't think you're much worried about how eloquent I am. Yeah. You just care about me. You yeah. know, And that's the same with God. I think that's super important. Absolutely. We talked about accountability last week for the Locker Room Podcast. If you didn't listen to that, you should check it out. But... We need that. We we've got to have people in our lives that are are, are we've given permission to to share in our victories and also to help us in our struggles so that we keep fighting the right, right fights and we stay on the right path and, and we're fighting for the right things. And we talk about groups around here. It's not just about spiritual activity. It's about being around. It's about being around the body of believers. It's it's having community. It's our churches. Our campuses are really big, and and you're not going to know anybody, everybody, and that's okay. But man, if you can know some people that really care for you, and when it hits the fan, you know who you can call. You know, it's not just yeah. a staff member, but you've got people that you're doing yeah. life with that, that Real matters people. so much. Yeah. You know, and and nobody's arrived, nobody's perfect, and I think that's super important. And then I added this one because I was thinking about this, but I love Revelation twelve eleven. It says, "And they have defeated him, the devil." by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. I love that. Yeah. I yeah. think, you know, the simplicity of this is this is a war drenched book. Yeah. 
And Revelation is, is, is really the epicenter of where all this is happening now, the end times. And he's saying, hey, you want to you wanna survive? You want to you wanna endure? You want to persevere? You want to overcome? It's by the blood of the Lamb. And yeah. it's by your story. And I, I think sometimes we think, my story's not that impactful. It's like, you were dead and God made you alive. You, you were far from him and he came and rescued you. And our story has so much value. And the more we tell our story, the more we remind ourselves of, of who we were yeah. and how lost we were and how, how beautiful this rescue story is and what he's done for us. And it changes us, you yeah. know. And so yeah. I think that's anything else that you think of, just how we win and do battle, anything else that you, or you can even highlight or dig in or if there's anything else that sticks out? No. I mean, I think you. I, I killed it. Right there. You killed it. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a couple passages, and I, I want to be mindful of our time. Um, Revelate, I'm sorry, Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 is what we've been referencing and you've yeah. been referencing. It's Paul's letter. It's the end of the book of Ephesians, and he's talking about the importance of us understanding okay. um, that we're in war, that we have an enemy, and that we got to fight. And and we don't fight with with the weapons of the world. We fight with divine weapons. And so he talks about these weapons. And this is worth our people doing a deep dive and spending some time studying and just digging out what yeah. these words mean and, and what that looks like. But it's Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. And then 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6, I, I, because we both mentioned it. And so I want to I want to read it. And then, and then just... I, if you would just if you were just expose a little bit of what that means, okay? So it okay. says, Second Corinthians ten three through six. It says, "For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does." Verse four: The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish. To, I'm sorry, to demolish strongholds. We demolish demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Yeah. Dig out what that means. Because there's so many of us that it really, the battle's in the mind you talked about. Yeah, that. well, you're going to think something. Right. So you may as, may as well think thoughts that are yeah. in captive yeah. to Christ uh, in alignment with his will and your his purpose. So the enemy puts thoughts in your mind. Uh -huh. You uh, think they come from you. You yeah. live under condemnation, just yeah. like I said earlier. So to take each thought captive is to say, is this coming from the enemy? Yeah. yeah. Is it coming from the world? Is it coming from me? Yeah. Or is it coming from God? Yeah. And the, uh, you know, if it's coming from God, do you dig into it? Yeah. You, right. You meditate on it. Right. But if it's coming from the world, you reject it. Right. And uh, taking it captive is kicking it out. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, you so, don't get to live here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so that's what we ought to be doing. Yeah. You know. Talk about real quick because sometimes there's a just a, a nuance here in this question: the difference between conviction and condemnation. So, like when we're battling, we've we've fallen, and yeah. there's some thoughts about how we feel, guilt, shame, whatever that is. Can can you help us discern between conviction and condemnation? Yeah. Well, shame uh, is saying the say, shame is is saying I did that. Yeah. Uh, but when it becomes a negative or debilitating, it's saying, I am that. I am that. I'm an alcoholic. So, I'm a porn addict. Yeah. I'm a loser. Yeah. So admission is not weakness. It's the yeah. pathway to strength. Yeah. And if you if you don't deal with that, you, you, you begin to identify yourself with that. Yeah. And then you live under condemnation, and that's not where God wants us to live. Right, right. Shame is... Uh, Tremendously destructive. I, I lived there for a number of years. Yeah, me too. Terrible place to live. Yeah. So. Yeah. One more passage, 1 John 4, 4. There's a ton of passages, but 1 John 4, 4 says, Yes, you, dear, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one that's in the world. And I think, again, we've spent a lot of time focused on Satan and demons today just for the, the understanding of what it is and what's going on and, and what happens in our day-to-day -day living and... And knowing that the end of the story, he's going to win. But but even in the midst of our right now, we fight from victory, not for victory. We know how this ends. And so for us to recognize that the one who's in you is greater than the one that's in the world, that's super important uh, to, to, to be this reminder for us every day as we, yeah. as we do this. 
Well, I think of that passage in, uh, I think it's John 14, where Jesus is saying, you know, I'm going to go back to heaven here. This yep. is kind of my last talk I'm going to have with you. The yep. upper room discourse is, yep. is, is called. And then he he gets down there to around verse 20, uh, 19. He says, I, I'm leaving yep. now. But after I'm gone, you will know this, he says. Mm -hmm. You will know something. Yep. And he says, I'm in the Father. Yep. The Father is in me. Yep. And I am in yeah. you. Yeah. And so we need to know that. Yeah. And so uh, there was a preacher out on the West Coast years ago. He's passed away now, but he used to, Ray Stedman was his name, but he used to stand in the pulpit at the beginning of every sermon and he would raise one hand to the sky and the other hand out to the audience. Mm. And before he would preach, he would say, everything coming from him, mm. nothing coming from me. Mm. And he called that, Charles Solomon and others who have written about it, called that the exchanged life. Mm. And so Paul talked about it in Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who live, yeah, Christ but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith yeah. in the Son of God. And so we need to live the exchange life. That's why I say the Christian life is impossible. Yeah. But an exchange life is possible. Absolutely. And it's very rewarding. We need to know that. That's good. Yeah. You uh you you'd given me a couple of examples or stories. And if you want to grab a couple of them. Well, uh, I think it just helps drive some of the points that we've been talking about home. Yeah. W one that uh you know comes to mind was a young lady from uh, seminary here nearby and uh, I was meeting with her and she was not happy and had a lot of issues but uh, we eventually got around to forgiveness mm -hmm. as you always do yeah you know and it's a big one so I started talking to her about who do you need to forgive well she mentioned five girls okay. that she had known when she was in college that sort of ganged up on her, as it were, sure. with the intent of destroying her emotionally and yeah. her self-esteem and so on and so forth. And uh, and so I said, well, you you know, you need to forgive them and I, I can help and uh, I'll lead you through a prayer. And she said, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. And uh, hmm. I said, well, uh, let me ask you this. Is, is what you've been doing yeah. For the past few years working for you. And she said, no, not really. And I said, yeah. well, why don't you do what works? Yeah. Why don't you do what works? Yeah. And she said, so you're saying I have to forgive? I said, it's, it's for your benefit. Yeah. Not theirs. Yeah. They, they don't even care. Yeah, they haven't thought any more about that. You make the decision. Done. I'm not going to do it, she said. Yeah, mm. And it pretty much in, ended our our time together, but mm. I've prayed for her and still pray for her because yeah. she had too much potential yeah. to ruin her life in the yeah. cesspool of bitterness. Yeah. And um, I just want her to be free. Right. Yeah, it's hard work. Yeah. But you got to do it. So for some reason, we think when we hold on to it, 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 it protects us. And it's yeah. like, it doesn't. Yeah. Well, it's the, anim the enemy sick. piggybacks on her pain, distorts right. our thinking. Makes right. us believe the lie. Yeah, he's got us right, right where he wants us. Yeah. So, you, we have a lot of your first example there. We have a lot of people that come to Christ in our church on a almost daily basis, definitely through the week. I mean, all kinds of baptism stories, and I think that first story is really, really cool. So, so because I've had that, I've had people come to me and go, "Man, let me talk to you about something." You know, so so share a little bit of that. You could talk about the guy who just became a Christian. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, he always said, since I've become a Christian, I've had more trouble <laughs> in my life than I ever had. <laughs> Would you sell me, man? Yeah. Yeah, and I said, well, I'm not surprised. Yeah, right. And, you know, what do you mean, he said. And yeah. I said, look, when you became a child of God, you gained an enemy you didn't have before. Yeah. And he said, well, who's that? And I said, that's Satan and all of his demons. I yeah. said, friend, the battle is on. <laughs> Put your cup on, man. Let's yeah. go. Yeah, and so that was an interesting conversation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, any other one of those real quick before we begin to bring the plane down? 
Well, I think uh, it might be worth telling about the woman that uh, was having a lot of emotional issues and depression mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And, and so I asked her how these things started and what she had done to, yeah. you know, to deal with it. And she said, well, my brother is a, is a lay pastor. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, he told me that what I need to do is listen to the angels. Yeah. And uh, so she, she, she was having dreams or visions. She was being uh, visited. depressed and yeah. had other issues. Okay. And some of them were clinical. Sure. Some of them weren't. But right. um, anyway, I said, so tell me about this, listen to the angels. And she said, well, he would come to my house mm -hmm. and he would have me lay down on the couch. Yeah. And then he would say, ask the angels to give you guidance, yeah. the truth. Yeah. And she said, you know, I would lay there and listen and I would pray to the angels and some of them, he said, had names or she said had names and so on and so forth. And I said, well, uh, I'll just call her Janet. That wasn't her name, but I said, Janet, the, the Bible says that we should test the spirits to yeah. see whether or not they're of God. Yeah. First John 4, 1. Yeah. And uh, I said, why don't you do that? Yeah. She said, what do you mean? I said, why don't you just... You're hearing from these angels. Right. I said, why don't you just ask the Lord to show you whether or not they're from him? Yeah. Test them. Yeah. So she prayed, Lord, I ask you to show me whether or not these angels are from you. Right. Whether these voices, these things I'm hearing are from you. And then she stopped and she waited for about a minute mm. and... She, then she turned to me and she said, it's all a lie. Mm. It's all a lie. And she realized that God was telling her that. Yeah. And uh, so. Yeah. They masquerade. Yeah. As, I'm as angels you, of light. Comforting which is spirit. Said. Yeah, you know? exactly. And, and uh, so, you know, just. Got to be mindful. You know, the, the solution is. In your heart and between your ears. Yeah. You know, a saved spirit and a, a uh, spirit-led mind. Mm -hmm. And that's where the battle is won. Yeah. You know. That's good. You are what you believe. Right. Uh, and so believe the truth. Right. That's your only chance. Yeah. We, we You and I have talked about this some, just about, and, and we're real close to wrapping up, but Taking our authority in Christ, uh, in the name of Jesus, get behind me, Satan. The, praying the, in the power of the cross, the power of and, and the blood of Jesus, flee from me. Those type of things. Talk about why and, and why, again, audibly. Um, well, the enemy can hear it, but yeah. he can't read your mind. Yeah. Again, he can put thoughts in your mind, but he yeah. can't read your mind. And so I like to pray out loud. Yeah. And I like to say, uh, Jesus, rebuke you. Yeah. Not I rebuke you. Yeah. May the Lord rebuke you, yeah. and which is scriptural. And uh, I like to say, uh, you know, in the name of Jesus, we enforce the power of the cross yeah. in this situation. Yeah. And again, it's inviting God into the room yeah. and praying biblical, truthful prayers. And it's yeah. you don't have to raise your voice. Right. You don't have to be angry. You don't have to make threats to the enemy. Right. <laughs> you. You claim your authority in Christ. It's kind of like this. If you put a rookie cop uh -huh. in an intersection yeah. with busy traffic and give him a whistle, yeah. he blows his whistle and puts his hand up. Nobody stops. Yeah. Well, nobody pays attention to him. But you put a seasoned yeah. officer yeah. in the intersection who's been doing this for 20 years. Yeah. He blows his whistle. He puts his hand up. Yeah. Car stops. Yeah. Car stops. Car stops. Why? He knows his authority. Yeah. When you know your authority, yeah. you have authority. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people don't know their authority in Christ. That's good. And, um, one question, just a practical question for the dads that are listening. Um, they have kids, whether they're in high school or, or they're in middle school or, or, or even kids. 
you know, how do you talk about this without freaking kids out? You know, I, I have conversation. I've just tried to normalize it, at least in my car rides with my girls or in conversations and things like that. But are there some things that you go, hey, here's a couple key simple tools just in, because it's not just for us, it's for the people that we care about. Yeah. And so just, gonna, just keep the conversation light in the yeah. sense of, I want you to sit down here. I want to tell you, <laughs> I want to tell you what Revelation 22 <laughs> really says. Right. You know, like, right. you don't do that with a seven year old. Yeah. yeah. You know, when they're 10, 11, you might read the Chronicles of Narnia sure. with them or to them. And yeah. They learn who Aslan is and yeah, Lion, and, lion. And, and but uh, there there are a lot of different ways. I try to, uh, you know, uh, uh, a child said to me the other day recently that uh, how, how they put it. Uh, oh, they believe that Satan is more powerful than God. That's what they said. Okay. <laughs> and okay. So I said, well, you know, I know God. Yeah. And I know Satan. Yeah. And there's no comparison. Yeah. That's I good. said, I can't even tell you how much more powerful God is. Yeah. That's all I said. Yeah. And I didn't, couldn't do much more and didn't need to do much more than that. Right. But um, a guy came to me recently and talked about, uh, he said, well, I don't believe Jesus is real. I don't believe he ever existed. Okay. And this is a well-educated, you know, uh, guy and... Um, I said, well, give me a hundred reasons why you don't believe that. And he just looked at me. I love your responses. I said, I can give you a hundred reasons why I believe he did live. Yeah. I can give you 10 right off the top of my head. Yeah. He said, well, what are the 10? I said, no, I want to hear. I want to understand why you're convinced that he doesn't exist. Yeah. He didn't really give me an answer. And so... You know, conversation moved on to something else. Yeah. But um, so anyway, mm. I, I digress again. But it's all right. So concluding, you uh, you you had a couple of things in here that I think it's I think it's helpful for you to share just about um, spiritual warfare and and all of that. So yeah. Well, <clears throat> when the kingdom of God moves forward, uh-huh. the kingdom of Satan pushes back. Yeah. I have to understand that. And that's what Jesus was talking about when he said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The church is doing the attacking. Yeah. The gates of hell are trying to withstand the attack. Yeah. So we need to understand that. Yeah. And the battle is ours, not the enemy's. And uh, we are the church. And we're not orphans. We're children of the king. Last I checked, he's still undefeated. That's right. And that means that we have all the edge we need, and uh, we need to be joyful, yeah. stand our ground. The battle is real. The stakes are high. We should be sure yeah. to win. That's good. And we will. Yeah. We have to remember that we get to see the end of the story. It's like all these people in the Old Testament that just on faith, yeah. you know, and it's like we we have a book that helps us understand What's gone before us, where the times that we're in now, kind of the Acts twenty nine period, and then we see it all. Yeah, you know, and mm-hmm. and so because of that, again, all this conversation today is not to, trying to freak people out. It's it's not to make people cower, and you know, we have no reason to fear the enemy. We don't. If if we don't get that point across today, we yeah. haven't gotten anything. Across. But you should know your enemy. Yeah. And you should know what his purpose, his his purposes and objectives are. And we have so many tools and weapons, again, not in our own strength, but in his strength that we can overcome. Yeah. And that's super critical for us. You know, we 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 will win because we are fighting from victory. It's already been done. The yeah. cross was enough. The empty tomb was enough. And he is seated at the right hand. And yeah. that matters for us. And so we don't have to wonder or question or doubt anymore. We can be anchored in who he says that he is and what he's going to promise to do. He's, now, he's let me piggyback on that last thought. Yeah. We are seated with him, Ephesians chapter 2, verse yeah. 6. Yeah. We are seated with him. Yeah. Then what to say? In the, the heavenlies. Heavenly realms. Yeah. In the spiritual realms, yeah. we are seated with 
Christ. Protected. So his authority yeah. is our authority. Yeah. Because we're seated with him yeah. in the heavenly realms. That's an important verse for people yeah. to understand. That's good. So a couple books here. Um that if you're interested in learning more, <laughs> they maybe go, I'm, I'm this plenty, plenty. <laughs> but if you're interested, you want to take a step. Boundary Breaker by Neil Anderson is a great book. Uh, it's a book that we give away to people. There are groups that meet around this, even in our church. Bondage Breaker. Uh, you, bo- said, I, you said Boundary. Sorry. You're thinking bondage. of Henry Cloud's book. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. 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 Thank you, sir. Bondage yeah. Breaker by yeah. Neil Anderson. Uh, the second one is The Adversary uh, by Mark. Uh, Bubeck. Mm-hmm. Uh, third is Spiritual Warfare by Carl Payne. You you got me onto him when I lived in Seattle. It's a great book. Uh, and then number four, this, the Handbook for Spiritual Warfare by Ed, not Eddie, but Ed Murphy. Yeah, uh, not the same right. person. Yeah, not the same guy. And that's a big book, right? Is yeah, that the one you said is very comprehensive. Very comprehensive. Yeah. Um, and then you've also uh, just blessed us with a link that'll be in the show notes that kind of gives you a little bit more deeper understanding about some. Anything you want to say about that? This is stuff every Christian needs to know. Uh, some of them are just diagrams and charts yeah. that kind of make biblical truth yeah. uh, transferable. Yeah. But I, I'd encourage people to look at those. Yeah. yeah, It's free. Yeah, it's free. Free.com. Yeah. Dude, thank you. Thank uh, you. Appreciate you, buddy. Appreciate uh, grateful your friendship. for your friendship as well, and it's cool to get to get to do another run with you here. And so really grateful for all that you do and just the impact that you're making. So Locker Room, that's it. Uh, we talked about your enemy. I hope you feel equipped to fight the most impo- for the most important things in your lives and live for Christ. I hope it generates some good conversations with God, with your spouse, with your kids, with a locker room group or a group that your guys are connecting with. And I just want to encourage you to, to get after it. There's a war. If you're not feeling like you're being attacked, maybe you're not doing anything. The reality is we need to be in this, and and the enemy will, will try to create some resistance. But again, we have our authority in Christ, and we can we can prevail. If you if this has been a help to you, or if you need help, um, or you'd like to share this podcast with with people, feel free to do that. If you need anything from us, you can email lockroom uh, at southland church. Um, again, if it's helped you, man, pass it on. Thanks for your time, Gary. Yeah, we'll, uh, it's a blessing. Thanks. We'll Appreciate get together it. next week, and we'll tackle the next two words. See you next time on Locker Room.